So, uh, first thing uh, to say is I want this session really to be a conversation. I'm not, I don't want to stand here and sit here for 45 minutes banging on endlessly about something I you know, some sort of feeling like that. I want to spend a few minutes just sort of setting out what I think the opportunity might be, and then I want to uh, open it up and just have a conversation. Uh, and I want to hear criticism. I want the whole thing to be broken and trashed and rebuilt uh, if, if there's an actual scope to rebuild. Okay. So um, without further ado, then. so uh, cooperation as a service. What the hell is that? So uh, I'm interested in this whole platform co-op thing uh, and what uh, what potential of it might be. I'm interested in. Um, uh, in, uh, new models of governance and new ways of doing things because I think that what the, what the sort of network is giving us is the ability to do things differently. And I think if we're going to be successful in sort of challenging the status quo and the, and the bits of internet giants, we have no alternative but to do with them, uh, different things in different ways. So, um, one of the things that I came across uh, a while back in which uh, I find really interesting is uh, a platform called Open Collective. Who, who, who's heard of Open Collective? No one? No one? Someone? Okay. So Open Collective is essentially a place on the internet where you can go and you can say, right, I'm going to start, start a new project. I've got a really good idea. I'm going to set up this Open Collective on this platform. So people can give me money. Uh, groups are using this. Uh, lots of groups are using this. Uh, lots of them are um, open source software projects because that's where they're targeting a lot of their activity at the moment. And uh, so these open source software projects have come along there, they're saying, setting up shop essentially, saying, yeah, come and support what we're doing, it's really good, give us some money, be part of our community. Thank you for doing it. Um, last time I checked, which was uh, a week or so ago, uh, Open Collective had something like 650 projects under its umbrella and it's uh, it moved something like three million dollars. That's not bad going, is it? Um, and there's only about four or five people involved in that undertaking as far as I know. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and then, uh, so we'll park that for a moment, that's Open Collective sitting over there. Then over here, we've got uh, some of the big sort of, uh, people that think about stuff in the open source world, some of the big organisations and uh, thinking groups uh, around, uh, around internet infrastructure and things like that, they're sort of saying, wow, there's this really big problem because lots of the internet is based on, I'm going to stand up, lots of the internet is based on this open source software, and yet if you look at the foundations that underpin that open source software, it's all pretty flimsy. There's actually a lot of stuff where you know, when you drill down right into the nitty gritty of it, there might be a handful of people in a smoke filled room writing code and half the planet's reliant on it. You know, it's crazy. It just doesn't stack up as a sensible model. It's not sustainable. Um, so, uh, and then you look at what's happening with a lot of these open source projects, the ones that grow and become successful and big, they tend to be co opted by capital. You know, the big players come into that space, IBM or Google or Microsoft or whatever they might be, they're coming into that space with their, with their dollars, their venture money, and they're sort of saying, yeah, we love this open source stuff, and uh, come and be co-opted by us. And, and that's sort of happening. So uh, that's potentially quite dangerous, I think, because if you look at what's happening, uh, again, in that space, in terms of licensing of that code, uh, more and more of those projects are being licensed under uh, licenses that enable the private sector to privatise that code. Okay, so they're not uh, they're not um, proper copyright licenses in, in that sense. And, and you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't comment particularly on the nitty gritty of that. But that's what that's sort of what I'm seeing in terms of the landscape out there. So there's lots of open source software projects happening, there's lots of people trying to do really interesting things with code, they're writing this code, they're releasing it, and uh, it's being gradually uh, co-opted by uh, 
the other side. Uh, so, uh, and then you look at you look at the open collective thing again, and you look at who's putting money into that, and some of those big corporates are in there. They're investing, you know, uh, because they're they themselves are reliant on some of this code, so they're putting money behind these things. So. It, on the face of it, it looks great, you know, it's okay, big corporates are coming in and they're funding open source software, isn't that fantastic? And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but is it sustainable? Where's it all going to end up? I don't think, you know, yeah, I don't like the look of this. So, uh, what I'm thinking about um, is the idea of trying to cooperativize some of these projects and thinking about how we might do that. So, there's some interesting projects out there that are using the sort of new digital tools to build uh, support mechanisms for cooperatives. Um, there's uh, in the States, the start.coop that's just started up, we've got uh, incubator.coop in uh, Australia, I'm involved with platform6.coop here in the UK, um, yeah, we're all sort of trying to do similar things and trying to sort of, okay, let's leverage some of these tools to, uh, to move the whole idea of cooperative development more into the, into the 21st century and how we do that effectively in a digitally mediated and networked environment. Uh, so, how do we bring these things together? So, um, I got in touch with one of the people at Open Collective, um, uh, Alana Irving, who you might have heard of. She used to be an inspiralist. She's now working part-time with Open Collective. And I said, I think it's fantastic what you're doing with this fiscal sponsorship whereby you can come and do stuff and get money in and you don't have to have a legal structure, you don't have a bank account. No, you know, it's really uh, it's really a very lightweight way to sort of get stuck in and start doing things. I think it's fantastic what you're doing. What about, uh, what about ideas around governance? And she sort of like pulled my arm off and said, yeah, that's exactly what we're trying, that's what we're interested in doing. We're interested in open collective itself becoming a cooperative in the medium term. We're interested in how we might deliver government support through a platform that we're, we're developing, and we're really interested in cooperative models. I'm thinking, okay, so now we've taken that idea of how we can use digitally mediated platforms to support cooperative development, which is which are and those existing platforms and the new ones that come through this current wave seem to be, to my mind, pretty much focused on uh, the usual suspects. You know, we're sort of talking to ourselves a bit in that, in that model because we're saying, hey, you want to be a cult? Come along here and we'll help you. So we're already reaching an audience there that, that people already are, I know about cults. Yeah, that's sort of okay. I think they can maybe do one because let's join this thing and we'll get started. But if we use this potential uh, opportunity that exists with Open Collective and maybe other things like it, uh, then we can reach out beyond those usual suspects and, uh, and, and get into a much wider, much bigger marketplace for organisations. Because my thinking about how software projects, uh, open source software projects, start how they operate in their early years is that they don't give uh, uh, a monkeys about governance. It doesn't really matter to them. What they're interested in doing is writing some code. So they'll do that and focus on that. And then they get to a point, if they're successful in what they're trying to achieve, they'll get to a point where government starts to become an issue for them. And they think, oh, Christ, how are we going to manage this? This is really knotty stuff, and we're not experts in the field. So, but if you've already, if they're already in this open collective space, which is helping them manage their finances, then you could also inject some governance into that space at the same time. So when they start thinking about governance, well, there it is, right in front of them, it's a cooperative, and that becomes the default setting for what they're trying to achieve. Um, so, uh, do I want to say any more? No, I don't think I want to say any more. That's it, really, that's the idea, that's the premise. So what I want to do now is really sort of uh, open up to conversation from the room, so fire away. Oh, uh, um, first of all, I totally agree. Uh, that uh, governance should not be an afterthought, but a premise, a default setting. And corporate structures are good, but not always the answer, but, and often they are. Um, I have a remark and a question, the remark being, or the information being, I'm a business mum, and it do, I do exactly that. What I do is I look for 
capital to meet initiatives, youngsters that are so nerdy that they're totally coding blah blah blah, but they have no, so I create safe sandboxes for them to function in. So that's the information, and the question is, if you say open up the market, because I want an impact, huh? I want a big impact. Uh, so if you say open up, do you mean open up more, like that we reach more of the, uh, of the youngsters, I mean, all that is nerdy and programming and platform creating and open source coding? Or do you mean that we reach out to the masses in terms of citizens' capital because we, have, we are incredibly rich with poor <coughs> governments? Okay, uh, so I'll respond to that um, briefly. My thought really about software and technology is that it's, uh, it's the first and most obvious opportunity for me. But it's not the only opportunity. I, I can see that the, you know, I've, got, I've got a very blinkered view of the world, obviously. So I can only see what I can see. But I think that the model that, that I'm talking about is broadly applicable. And it just needs the mechanisms and the reach to market that are appropriate for those different opportunities. Yeah? So I'm just talking about software because, uh, because it's something that I've seen a little bit of and I know a little bit about. OK? So yeah, by all means, I'm very happy to have that same sort of broad approach apply to uh, a thousand other opportunities. Mm, okay. yeah. So we go with the gentleman who's nicely weighted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so our, on government, uh, we have open source uh, software projects, right? A lot of the governance, I think, is almost invisible or sort of embedded in the um, communication structure that it uses, right? So, like, if you choose to structure it around a Reddit, a subreddit, or a uh, message board, you get a sort of different sort of like behavior out of that. I was running a few. It's almost like the, gov the government is there from the start, it's almost just like invisible. Yeah, but it's sort of, it, it's shaped by the technology yeah. to a degree, it's shaped by the people yeah. to a degree, and also uh, I think that the, the default setting, certainly in the early stages, is that it's very, uh, it, it's essentially a meritocratic community. Okay? If you get on and do stuff, then you get status within the community. Uh, and that's fine. I mean, you know, it sort of works pretty pretty well, I think, in the early stages of a project. But it's, it's when it starts to run up against the limitations of that model. I think someone said to me the other day, the whole concept of meritocracy was invented by somebody who uh, thought it was a really bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, so it's, about, it's about when projects reach that point, and maybe if you can get something in earlier, and you can avoid some of those. Yeah, okay, so I want to challenge a bit. I have two types of challenges. The first one uh, has to do with the fact that people, when they write open source software, they don't write open source software for money. They start for all different reasons. You said it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of engineers having fun yeah. on the weekend yeah. together, right? So instead of actually trying to change that and introduce governance there, governance there, I think we should take that for granted that people who start open source software for their own reputations and then eventually actually we start thinking about some of these different programs at the different states. That's my personal take on that. That's the first thing. The second thing on open collective, while I think that this is interesting and what they're doing and the whole donation thing is quite cool, I don't think it fundamentally changes the landscape. Still like I believe that engineers just you know they have their own networks as well, right? There are opportunities in co-oping these networks rather than actually again depending on this external hand that wants support. So do you don't mind you. I think they're both very good points, yeah. I mean, I, I've got no real response to either. That's excellent, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to make a... Uh, sorry. Do you want to comment? I want a comment. Yeah. First of all, I think you're Spanish. I'm Greek, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> South Europe. South Europe. Yeah, we all South Europe. Europe. <laughs> I call it the economic Stockholm syndrome. Okay. It seems that in South of Europe, everybody seems to code out of nothing, for nothing, and you know, to starvation. I promised everybody who wrote one hour of coding for our platform that he or she will get paid. Because, I, because when you are coding for free, it's because that time is already paid for by a third party that holds some kind of power, which you are either you know, employed or whatever. So, so many talented people don't have the luxury, the structure, the governance, the possibility to be coding without almost starving. And on my watch, 
this will not happen. <laughs> so I do have, I do raise lots of money. I do I, I tomorrow I give a workshop how I do it exactly. But I do raise capital because I want every hour of code, open source code, to be paid for and that people can live from it. First of all. Secondly. <laughs> Bear in mind we have some other things. No, I'll, I'll, I'll hold my second. That's yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, thank you. Uh, yeah. I'll get myself. So, I want to come. So, hello, I'm Mark Martinus from Co-op Culture. So, I help start and grow co-ops, uh, and particularly interested in governance. So, really excited the interesting stuff that's coming around, particularly through the open co-op platform co-op movement uh, around sort of like digital sociocracy. Lots and lots of interest in all cooperatives in using these models. Which, which, as far as I can see, are basically uh, predicated on, it's almost like, how do we develop, run, and grow an organization the same way as we run our software projects? Lots of excitement around that. The, the challenge is, is to map that onto the underlying stuff that we have to have around company structures and things like that, and the underlying sort of uh, accepted practice around governance. Uh, so that's the really exciting thing around that. So what I'm really saying is, there's a real virtual circle here, is what we're developing for what we're doing here with a digital focus is a real interest and excitement and possibly even marketable to the rest of the cooperative movement and wider. Okay. We've collect, collected our remaining two points and then I'm going to ask if you want to do things to like them. So gentlemen with the rainbow break. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of throw in something um, that I think is that. Like who coders are. Um, and I, and I think like sometimes we have an idea that you know that the like the people in manufacturing icons are all sitting in a factory somewhere on a production line running one piece of code each. I think that's a really poor metaphor. I think there are probably some shops that go like that, they're probably more graphic design shops um, run by marketers. But um, the minimum model that I use is punk rock. Um, what is punk rock, particularly with open source? Is it people get together to create a software project for the same get reason reason what well, similar underlying reasons to why people get together and play music. It's because they're really passionate, they want to create something with a vision, they have some ideas about how they're going to work together to realise it. And, and I absolutely agree with what's being said, that there's no thought about it's governance, because there's no thought about the future, no future. It's about creating it now. So then the question becomes, if they do create something that people need to become dependent on, something that needs to be funded going forward, that, that's where the rubber meets the road. And in, in punk rock, what happens is people sell out, uh, they get a, a record deal, the corporation takes over and then they own that product henceforth. And, I think, and, and this, we see the same thing with digital, you know, Google buys it or Facebook buys it, the underlying dynamic is very similar. And what we're trying to do is create a structure that can step in just before the corporation gets there to sign that record deal. And go, no, no, sign with us instead, we'll take better care of you, yeah. we'll get more of the profits back, etc, etc, et cetera. Et cetera. Well, one last question and then I'd like to bring to come back to you. It's more more of a comment uh, and, a, and, a, and a request than a question, sorry. Um, so, Co-ops UK, we've been registering co-ops for 150 years, but it's exactly that point about how we've been doing for 150 years is not the way we should be doing it now. And so it's a kind of a request to the sector to say, how can we help you register co-ops so that you don't have those legal financial problems too late in a way that works for you? So we've literally just put our company rules for a work co-op on GitHub, so you can play with it, you can fork it, you can do stuff with it. And that's just because we, we're not tech people, we're legal people. So we want to talk to you about how to, that interface of what we've done for 50 years and what you guys are doing now. Hey, it's just clean. Can you flip your lanyard? Yeah. Oh, John, <laughs> John Cox UK. Uh, you just, you've just gone back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Greg, do you have any comments on all of the different uh, Okay, so well, just coming back on that one about legal structures and, and all that sort of stuff, I think that's really important. But I think Part of, the, part of our problem as a, as a movement, as a cooperative movement, is we're, we're very focused on all that stuff. We love it. We really get our hands into the nitty gritty of Clause 78B. We you know, really enjoy all that stuff. But actually, if you look at what Open Collective is doing as a, as a platform, it's just saying, okay, we're not really interested in all that right now. Uh, we'll deal with that later when and as it's appropriate. What we're doing now is uh, is we, we just want to uh, enable this stuff to flow. And that's exactly what your point there is. You know, people are coming together, 
they're passionate about what they do, they've got a great idea, they just want to crack on. They're not interested in legal structures or bank accounts or any of that rubbish. What they want to do is what they want to do. But they, you know, it's about what happens when the rubber meets the road, then you need to be ready to go. And, the, and the, our problem is, is that you go and speak to any accountant or lawyer or bank manager anywhere in the world, pretty much, and they're going to say, yeah, just set up a company. And then you can own that stuff. And then what you find is, okay, well, then they, they need to raise some money. What then needs to happen is you get an investor coming in and saying, yeah, yeah, I'll give you some money. You just give me 50% or 51% of what you win. And, and that's it. Bang. Exit strategy and you're down the road. Okay? And that's what we don't want to have happen. So, so I know we've got some more questions. People have got their hands up. We've got 15 minutes left. And I suppose, Graham, I'm wondering about what would be of most use to your idea? Okay. So uh, one thing is we can keep on going with questions like this, which I think will be one sort of fun. Another kind of thing is if you have something you need help with, we can ask yeah. the group for help. We can split the group and yeah. the yeah. What would be the most useful thing for your idea? Uh, I don't know what the most useful thing yeah. is. A useful thing. Uh, I, I think that there are useful. lots of useful things. What I'm, uh, what I'm really excited about is we've got a room full of people on the basis of, you know, 30 words that I wrote on Lumio the other week, which is, so there's clearly interest in, in this idea. Um, no one's yet said, no, it's absolute rubbish, and it will never fly. So that's also very encouraging. So uh, I guess, um, you know, I'm very happy to try and facilitate an ongoing conversation about this. Um, and uh, you know, Laura's here from the Digital Life Collective. I'm also involved with the Digital Life Collective, diglife.com. So there's an opportunity for a, for a bit of a framework that might facilitate that. There's a, they've got an open discourse platform where we can carry on this conversation, and that's at... Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, okay. So go to diglife.com and you'll find a link to a, a public discourse platform, a forum platform where we can carry on then. So I'll, I'll post something up there following this, because I, you know, I came to this uh, session thinking, well, I might get two or three people along, who knows. So but we've got yeah, 30 odd people in there, which is fantastic. So there's clearly something there. So if anyone's got any ideas now in the remaining 10 minutes about uh, where to go with it next, then speak up. Just a quick question on the, the definition of, of governance. Do you see it as being a code of practice, a constitution, a, a written sort of codified practice? Or do you see it as being something that is uh, more of a, maybe a, a culture, something that needs to be learned, or something that may be enabled by a tool, but also takes a bit of, a bit of learning, a bit of experience from people coming into it? Because I think it sounds like when you have these problems, these conflicts, you need the softer side as well as just the rules. And I, I wonder if you've got any ideas for how to deal with that. Okay, uh, I think it's a very good point. Yeah, so uh, we tend to sort of start talking about concepts and then immediately fall back on some concrete stuff that's down there. So if it's as, you know, if it's GitHub, then that's the default governance model. Or if it's uh, you know a code of practice, right? Okay, let's write write it up and there's a document that we can stick on the forum or whatever. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It is about culture as well, uh, and I, you know it's it's that whole spectrum that, that needs to be. Uh, engendered and fostered, and I think that uh, someone uh, in the corporate development Lumio group uh, the other day uh, was talking about the idea of non-executive directors. Uh, you know, that's a very formal approach, but you could equally have a, a, a mentor or you know, a softer uh, approach there. So you, if you, you, know, you go down that room, and, and there's maybe somebody there who's just sort of nudging. You know, like David here has been really helpful facilitating this session. I didn't really ask for it, but he's, he's done a fantastic job in my view. Um, I mean, this very uh, but he's not been he's not been heavy handed at all. I don't think he swore at anyone. <laughs> um, so you know, that sort of model. There are eight where, you know, he's, He knows how to do these things better than I do. So he's done a fantastic job of just sort of guiding us through this 45 minutes quite effectively, I think. So that sort of cultural injection, as it were, is also really important. Uh, so I just want to make sure we ca the people who originally put up their hands when we said things about the future, let's cover them off. So David, speaking quite loudly. Oh, like the Sorry. future, what I'd love to see 
is an equivalent for digital co-ops to support that startup scale. If you're in Belfast in the Titanic quarter, you can win a competition and get some government money. Then you go to Halo at Software Angels and get funded from that. You can hire a, you can hire space in the science uh, buildings there. There's a whole lot of mechanisms and support mechanisms for people going down the startup route. If how would we do the same for people yeah. going to become software or digital, actually software hardware digital co-ops? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Good point. Thank you. Uh, just, just really quickly on that, go to the uk.com slash the hive. There's a business support program for new start co ops. It's not full signal dancing, but it's, it's a start. Yeah, so just great. the hive for co ops. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good. Just very briefly, there's an open space that follows on from this really nicely tomorrow afternoon uh, about the open app ecosystem. So that's. Um, Ideally, going to attract a bunch of people that are developing things like Lumio, um, software that's intended to be used by people doing cooperative decision making or, or running um, some sort of cooperative activity. Um, but it's also really useful to have people come along who are potential users of those kind of platforms, especially users of platforms that don't exist yet, to kind of tell us what needs to be created so that we can then go out and, and recruit some programmers who are like, yeah, I had an idea like that. I didn't think anyone wanted it before this project started. Do you happen to remember what time it was? Uh, after lunch, sometime. Okay. <laughs> you can look it up, sir. Uh, no, just a provocative question, but are we talking about free software or open source? Because it's not the same thing. <laughs> because, no, open, we say uh, like uh, free software yeah. is open source with a purpose. Because uh, free software, this is Richard Stallman. Uh, which is like a uh, EP, and uh, open source is Eric Mem Raymond, which is like a Trump supporter <laughs> who likes games. So, uh, I mean, uh, maybe, but it's the same thing. Yeah, I did, I, 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 I did touch on that at the, at the beginning of the session. Yeah, but, the, but in the end, it's the, the same thing because you can do whatever you want, and uh, what the, the licenses are, are the same. You can use commercially uh, the software to make whatever you want. And, then on what you were saying about, about the money, I hear what you are saying about the money, but what we are trying isn't what we are trying, uh, getting people doing more and more things for nothing, uh, for no money. I mean, uh, because what kind of kills the, the developer culture is like the, the bro developers. You know, now in Silicon Valley, the guys who were, who later were uh, into financing and uh, uh, banking and all of that. No, they go into the developer stuff because there's lots of money to make. So we have to. This is what Richard Stallman was saying. We have to uh, to accept that developers need to get paid the same amount of money as normal people, as normal workers. They, they are not. It's, it's a problem. Like uh, paying too much the, the developer. Yeah. We have our next session is at ten two. People might want to move to their next thing. We've got two minutes left. I just want to move back to you, Graham. Could you just encapsulate for yes. us, like your elevator pitch of what it is you want, of what you're talking about, and then what is it you've taken from the conversation so far? Today? Okay. Uh, so elevator pitch is that I want uh, to change the world through uh, cooperative structures, and I can see this as a as a sensible way forward to try and achieve that um, through uh, making uh, cooperation a default setting in uh, industries and sectors where currently that isn't the case. That's the elevator pitch. Uh, I'd like to um, say that uh, I've found this really energizing, so thank you everyone for coming along and for giving input. We'll set the thing up uh, so that we can carry on the conversation. Um, you know, I know very little about the software industry. I know uh, a little bit about cooperatives and, and how uh, the two of those things might come together. So I'm hoping to learn a lot more as we try and move this idea forward and develop concepts of cooperation at scale. Um, and and some, a suggestion, you don't have to take the suggestion, but we've got lunch in whatever, 45 minutes, a bit more. If somebody who knew the software side was to come and find you over money, you could talk about it. I'm very and happy to talk then. to anyone that wants to talk to me, essentially. Yeah. That's why I'm here. So, uh, and with that, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.